Welcome everybody to uh, uh, this session of the uh, GigaNet at the uh, International Governance Forum 2021. We're happy to have you all here. We have a uh, uh, quite a rich uh, panel and I'm uh, glad to see so many participants in the room. Hopefully we can have uh, a bit of a, of a good discussion. Uh, I do encourage everyone to use the chat function to uh, write whichever comments or, or questions you have. Hopefully we'll have some time for questions and answers uh, at the end of uh, the session. Uh, we have uh, five speakers today and uh, uh, we need to keep to, to the timing. So uh, hopefully everybody can, uh, can have a chance to, to present uh, their uh, rich uh, information. Uh, and so I'm gonna ask the participants to, to please uh, stick to around eight minutes if, uh, if possible. I'm gonna try to keep the timing and sort of give you a nudge if you, uh, if you go uh, above that. Um, so the theme for this session is uh, internet principles and practices under the magnifying glass. We're gonna start with uh, a paper uh, uh, from uh, Hannah Zamurd Butt. Uh, inequalities of access in at spaces of global internet governance, dialogue and exchange. So Hena, the floor is yours. Thank you. And thank you so much for um, accepting my paper and inviting me. Um, it's been a really interesting day of presentations. I'm happy to share my own. My paper addresses this theme of inequities of access in, in and at spaces of internet uh, governance, dialogue and exchange. And um, it's a part of my broader PhD thesis um, in which I look at several groups and how they're interacting with these themes. Uh, but this paper in particular is addressing Global South youth activists and their um, experiences uh, of access and how they manifest in these spaces. And beyond that, I'm also interested in how these spaces and the events and the organizers um, shape these access experiences and discourses as well. Um, so what I've used is a multi-sited um, ethnography as a, as a methodology um, for addressing these multiplex sites of uh, internet governance, as Franklin calls them. Um, and in particular, I'm looking at um, RightsCon, IGF and Mozilla Festival. So some more familiar, some less. Um, and the concept of access itself is the anchor that moves us through these different spaces. The people that I'm observing are Global South youth activists um, who I've been working with for about three years. Over this period of time, I've been interviewing them at the conferences, outside of the conferences, uh, with a view to kind of understanding their work, both inside and outside the spaces. Um, and I have to kind of caveat that this isn't work that's done to create generalizations or universalizations. This is situated knowledge um, about their, their experiences. Um, and I've chosen this group um, with a view to kind of decolonial praxis of border thinking or choosing the margins. Now I'm going to dig straight into the findings because um, I, I kind of think the granular detail here is what's um, interesting in the research. So the first group that I worked with is two activists called Sam and Pat, and they were involved with um, the organisation of uh, Mozilla Festival back in 2020, um, which was an online event. And they took on positions of volunteering to help organize the, the, the festival. And um, they called the position uh, that of a wrangler. And this is some of the experiences that they had um, involved in this kind of um, role. So the first thing that they noticed is that they had to be a part of this. There are very few opportunities for people from their background, as they felt it, to be involved in internet governance. And so taking on these kind of voluntary positions is one of the few opportunities. And um, they thought of Mozilla as a kind of conduit to, to, to developing a career into this space. Um, but then there's a kind of an element of coercion because whilst they wanted to be involved in, in the space, they also didn't think that they could um, do it whilst also being um, paid for their work, paid for their labour uh, in an equitable way. So they saw other um, colleagues that were working for the core Mozilla uh, team who were getting paid uh, much more money than they were. They just got an honor honorarium. The second thing that um, Sam and Pat noticed is that they were kind of brought in to um, speak up to marginalized voices and to represent their communities and regions. Um, but because there were so few of them, there was just these two members, um, they felt that they weren't really um, in a welcoming atmosphere to these perspectives and they were having to fight quite hard to have their voices heard to a point where it was kind of putting them off actually speaking out. 
the last kind of reflection I'll mention from, from Sam and Pat is um, they talked about the way in which sessions were selected for the conference itself, which there was a core part of their role. Um, and at Mozilla Festival, this involved an application process that was quite formalized. Uh, and they felt that that was benefiting people who were familiar with this kind of northern, global north style application uh, processes. Um, and, and they also noticed that the issues that were being selected by Mozilla or, or, or by the other wranglers around them that were part of programming, uh, those tended to be um, uh, ones which were more interesting to them also around kind of AI, but not necessarily issues that were more relevant to them from their Global South perspective. Now, moving on to the next group of activists. Um, this is a group of nine um, Global South identifying youth activists, so under 35, um, who I met at the IGF in 2019. Um, and they had joined as part of the youth at IGF, but they still felt um, that whilst in the youth section they were welcomed, when it came to the main IGF, their perspectives on non-youth issues, they just weren't welcomed. Um, so they decided to create their own workshops, and I followed them as they um, applied to two different workshops um, to hold them at the IGF in 2020 and in 2021. And I, I, I can go into detail in maybe in the questions and how they work together, because I think it is interesting. But what ended up happening was that the two of their two sessions, one was rejected without any kind of information. Um, but I did notice that when they were putting that application together, they were very much interested first and foremost in finding a way to be at IGF. And secondly, about the issue. So the issue didn't necessarily come first when they were putting together their workshop proposal. It was about how can we uh, work this system to be present? And then the second one that I was observing, well, they thought they had been rejected. And this morning, you can see my screenshot there. They got this, I got this message saying that they just found out that their session was going ahead and they, they did a great job, they did it off the cuff. But um, I still need to explore what exactly happened there, but it's a, an interesting finding potentially. Now, the last group I want to talk about is um, Digital Grassroots. They are a youth um, activist group um, founded by two women uh, from um, Zambia and from Nigeria, Ufa and Esther. And um, I observed them at RightsCon. Um, and they held two sessions there. And I think they were, these, this group is very interested in like conceptualizing um, in their activism. And they bring up this point of internet universality and internet governance, and they bring it together, which is something that I've seen quite rarely, which is they're asking the question that we're expanding access, but are we exp expanding the realm of governance as well, of internet governance? Um, and they raise also the question in this particular session of whether we should, whether inclusion into existing internet governance systems is what should be sought by the Global South Youth, or whether they should be looking to create new systems. The other session of theirs that I observed um, was in 2021. And here, um, two uh, feminist activists were talking about what kind of internet are we bringing Global South women onto um, when there can be so much online violence faced by these groups once they come online. Um, and they were advocating for a kind of dual approach where they're trying to create safety for these groups as they come online, but at the same time looking to address this broader question of are we bringing people online into a hostile environment? So the kind of conclusions that I want to um, close on, um, firstly, um, I noticed the importance of considering um, the organizing processes of a space like Internet Governance Forum, as well as um, the issues themselves, because that should also potentially be considered as a part of Internet Governance. How do we make selection of who's included and who's excluded? I'm also interested in the role of these spaces, uh, of dialogue and exchange, as I call them, in framing topics um, selectively, so the discursive aspects and role that they play, as well as in giving out resources um, in terms of the limelight or funding um, broadly because they're now seen. What role are they playing? What I noticed is restricted and um, restrictive access being practiced. Um, alongside a rhetoric of universality. And for, for the youth activists that I worked with, this created um, a real diminishing of, of their trust in these institutions. And um, what I'm really interested in, in terms of future research is looking more at the circulation of ideas and spaces, of ideas and people in these spaces like RightsCon, and I know there's so many others, and seeing how um, things happen and operate in between the spaces, um, also regionally and um, informally as well. And I'll finish there. Thank you for your attention. Perfect timing. Thank you so much. That was uh, really interesting. I already have uh, a few questions in mind if, <laughs> if we get to that. But I, I just realized that I have not introduced myself and I apologize for that. My name is Rasha Abdallah. I'm a professor of journalism and mass communication at the American University in Cairo and a former member of the IGF MAG 
um, and I, I have the honor and the pleasure of, uh, of uh, chairing this session uh, today. So uh, we move on to our next paper without further ado. Uh, and uh, uh, this next paper comes uh, to us from two authors, Tiziana Lockett from Dublin City University and Maria Weigermars. I hope I didn't completely kill that. I'm sorry if I did, please correct me if I did, uh, from Maastricht University, but their paper is entitled An Ideal in Crisis, Critiquing the Global Politics of Internet Freedom Rankings. Go ahead, guys. Thank you, Russia. Um, and also, how lovely to see some fellow Global Voices community members here. Yay. Um, so my name is Tatiana or Tanya, choose whichever you like. Um, this is a paper that me and my colleague Maria Viermars have co-authored together, and it actually looks at one more instrument of internet governance, and that is the internet freedom rankings that we all know and love so well. Um, so the idea we had uh, when approaching this paper is we know that internet rankings and internet freedom rankings in particular are used by so many actors around the world. Um, you know, they're, they're used to make statements and claims and frame um, what, what is happening in countries around the world. Um, their indicators and their scores um, take on different meanings depending on uh, who is talking about them and, and how they're being used. But the question we had was, you know, how uncritically are these rankings used and what do we actually know about how they measure internet freedom and how they define internet freedom? Um, and our core sort of hypothesis was that, well, internet rankings are probably not apolitical and they probably have their own politics. So we set out to find what that politics was. You know, and so here's a few examples of different, you know, um, media outlets using different rankings. Um, some of the more familiar rankings that you may all have seen and maybe even used in your own work are, uh, rankings like freedom on the net one of the more uh, long-standing rankings that has been around since 2009 and has grown to cover 65 countries around the world right and what it does is it assesses internet freedom around the world um, on a few indicator sets um, they have three groups obstacles to access limits on content violations of user rights and they assign scores to countries free partly free or not uh, or not free um, right, so that's one example, but there are also lots of other kinds of rankings or indices. So enemies of the internet is a, um, a ranking by Reporters Without Borders that basically assigns um, a label of enemy of the internet to different countries, but also companies or particular agencies or even individuals. Um, and the, that list changes every year. Um, yet another example um, is a ranking that targets specifically corporations, such as the ranking Digital Rights Corporate Accountability Index. Um, this has been around since 2015 and disclosure, um, I am one of the contributors to research on this ranking. And again, it's expanded over time um, from eight to 26 companies, um, and it looks at how good the companies are at disclosing uh, their values and their priorities and commitments um, on governance, freedom of expression, and privacy. So we have all these different rankings, um, and essentially, right, they serve as a comparative tool uh, and often as a kind of shorthand to help people make decisions uh, providing specific kinds of information and also specific assessments um, on uh, how internet freedom is doing poorly or doing better in a particular country or in a particular company. But internet rankings, um, internet freedom rankings aren't just that, they're also a technology of knowledge production, right? So one of the functions they serve is they turn complicated phenomena, you could arguably say that internet freedom is such a complicated phenomenon, into rather unambiguous measures, right? Because they try to um, kind of turn it into a set of indicators or some numbers or a score, right, to, to help us assess what is going on in a particular country, for instance. But they have significant political power because they can often affect a state's international status, right? They can turn the state into um, a paria um, among nations or actually be praised for improvements in internet freedom. But they also affect what NGOs and digital rights activists uh, do because very often um, scores um, are how well a country scores on internet freedom may often impact aid allocation or how much grant funding is allocated to particular regions or particular countries, right? So they are a really, really important tool. Um, and of course, um, right, there's uh, existing critique uh, of other international rankings that measure democracy or media freedom levels. And again, some of these are published by the same actors. 
Um, right, the criticism that these rankings have faced is that they often have a neoliberal understanding of democracy, that they emphasize individual liberty and not necessarily structural or um, you know, systemic socioeconomic factors. Um, yet another criticism is that these rankings um, have assumptions and values um, that are reinforced because they become then ingrained in international institutions that uncritically uh, use these measures. And those global indicators are mostly created in the global north, but data collection usually occurs in the global south, right? So there's a bit of a discrepancy there. And all of these critiques certainly apply to internet freedom rankings as well. Um, right, so the assumption is that internet access would promote democratization by supporting access to information, freedom of expression and association is integral to a lot of internet freedom rankings. Um, but actually it's, as we know, it's, it's quite complicated, right? Because the internet may strengthen authoritarian regimes. We now know that um, surveillance technologies, um, data gathering, profiling, all of these things are also something that internet access enables. And it's actually increasingly seen as a possible threat to democracy and security because of disinformation, hate speech, and all of those uh, factors. So what we did was to examine some of those underlying assumptions. We looked at all the rankings that imply certain hierarchies by ranking and comparing country performance using indicators or proposed value judgments or recommendations based on those numerical scores or other categories assigned. And we looked at the background and the landscape of each of the funding. So we ended up with about 20 different ones. Um, and then what we tried to do, we proposed a non-exclusive typology based on what aims these rankings pursue um, to understand how um, they diversify based on their approach and presentation strategies. So we, we have three broad groups measuring and comparing, and Freedom on the Net is an example of these, right? They measure internet freedom in order to compare countries on the basis of this measurement and try to present themselves as objective classifications. Then there are rankings that do the work of presenting or framing and enemies of the internet as a core example of this ranking where they don't really provide a lot of data or numbers, but they just assign labels and prioritize framing um, in narrative ways, those decisions. And the third type of rankings is encouraging action. These are rankings that explicitly encourage policy change, um, that encourage company policy um, amendments and improvements, and corporate accountability index is, is an example of such a ranking. So the three core trends that we've spotted during our analysis uh, was that all rankings um, have shown um, kind of a trend towards greater granularity. So internet freedom is becoming a, a more complex a concept and that certainly is reflected in the ranking. So they add more details, they add more subcategories, they focus on particular stakeholders or audiences that are affected by internet freedom restrictions. The second trend is the development towards increased complexity, right? So methodologies become more complex, presentation of the rankings becomes more expansive, they add maps, dashboards, but they don't necessarily become more transparent or accountable. They don't report on changes in their methodology so well. They don't um, provide raw data or score sheets. So that is a, a drawback in terms of comparative uh, value of these rankings. And the third change is the ongoing shift in inclusion criteria and framing. Which countries are included? More and more democracies are added to internet freedom rankings. And not only just only states, but institutions and companies are also classified as offenders or actors who have power in this realm. So that points to the fact that there is, a, again, an understanding that it's not just enough to say this state is doing badly, but which institutions in the state are doing badly or which companies. Um, so to conclude, uh, we understand that the number and diversity of rankings are indicative of Internet freedom being a contested concept and a moving target. Um, most rankings still approach internet freedom from this Western neoliberal perspective, uh, which seems detrimental uh, to understanding the full complexity. Uh, they continue to be predicated on connections to democracy and media freedom uh, and reinforcing this dichotomy. Uh, you know, internet freedom is arguably better in democracies than in non-democracies, and they fail to acknowledge the complexity of issues related to more structural factors such as internet access infrastructure and governance. The rankings aren't neutral, but in some cases, um, their narrative uh, and their framing take precedence over being really precise about their methodology and empirical evidence. And one of the key issues is this lack of transparency about methodological changes that compromises the validity of long-term trends, uh, but still gets exposure for their claims, even though they're not necessarily grounded in disclosure. 
Um, archival practices are warrant specific reevaluation because most rankings are really poor about providing access to back issues and back years. Um, we use the Wayback Machine way too much. Uh, so this is a really a, a core takeaway for diplomacy, but also research and policy making. Thank you. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Tanya. That was uh, very, very interesting. Uh, we move on to our third uh, paper, uh, AI Narratives and Unequal Conditions. And this is authored by Alexa Robertson and uh, Max uh, Macaroni, I hope I'm saying that correctly, uh, from the Department of Media Studies, Stockholm University. The floor is yours, guys. Thank you. So Max and I are going to be presenting this together, but I'm doing the driving, uh, so I hope the slides work here. Um, so our starting point is the scholarly debate on communication and inequality. It goes back decades, um, but has of course taken on new urgency and complexity as a result of globalization and technological development. AI brings both of these things into focus. Um, and in our paper, we turn to the voices of tech experts and activists and analyze how they make sense of it from a narrative point of view. The study is part of a larger project um, investigating the connection between communication and inequality. One component of that project is the analysis of global news representations. A second component is an interview study with journalists reporting to global audiences. Um, the news professionals we've talked to often see technology as a tool for connecting to marginalized populations, but of course something also that perpetuates that mar marginalization um, and inequalities. The people in focus in this third uh, component study, the one that our paper um, is about, you could say they're communicators in their own right, as well as um, experts when it comes to communication technology. We collected uh, material from two fora, uh, where such expert activists from around the world gather to discuss issues related to internet governance, as we heard in, in Hannah's paper. Um, so they're the, the 2020 gathering of RightsCon and Sweden's Internet Dagarna, or Internet Days. Um, we choose to think of these um, fora as giving us access to a sort of wired civil society. And we argue that um, these four represent communicative spaces that are both liminal and global. A quick word about what we mean by liminal. Uh, the word is often used to describe being on the margins or the periphery, um, perhaps more so being in an ambiguous place in this case. Um, so the people we talk to or the voices that we listen to and analyze are at the center of an increasingly influential expert community, um, but they don't have economic or formal political power. So they have more power than Henna's, Sam and Pat, um, but less than regulators. We also use uh, the term liminal in the sense of occupying a position at or on both sides of a boundary or, or threshold. Um, this applies to most of the speakers in our study. They're very difficult to categorize because they occupy several roles. Um, they move rapidly from one position or sector to another in their professional life, unlike uh, university professors. Um, we understand liminality in another sense as well, and that's in a dynamic sense, as relating to a transitional stage or process. It's repeatedly pointed out in these fora that societies are at a critical juncture because technology and its applications are, are developing a lot more rapidly than policymakers and other social actors are responding. And the narratives that we accessed here are full of histories that compare ancient times with the present. And by ancient times, uh, these speakers mean the 1960s or 70s, um, and sometimes they actually mean the olden days of 2012. Um, they do that to highlight how we find ourselves in a period of transition. The quote on the slide shows how one speaker put it. In the paper, we analyzed a sample of 30 expert voices from around the world to find answers to three research questions. 
So our first question was what narratives about AI emerge from the discourse of these fora? The second was, is a common narrative discernible or do voices emanating from different spaces, be they professional or geographical, contribute different types of stories? And third and finally, what can be learned from those differences when it comes to the epistemological and empirical inequalities at the socio-technical interface? And the speakers whose talk we analyze call for the demystification of AI. So several speakers say that AI needs to be taken out of its black box. They also highlight the importance of unveiling myths about AI and who is behind them. Um, as we all know, a lot of Bartian sort of myths circulate in the form of fiction or pop cult texts. So why a narrative approach? Well, because the transcripts are full of stories. Um, and because narratives in general and AI narratives in particular are used by powerful actors to generate specific understandings of AI and its implementation. And we argue that narrative analysis is a helpful way of laying bare um, power relations, both discursive and regulatory. Um, I refer you to the paper for details of our narrative approach. The AI re related uh, problems that recur in the narratives, these narrative themes um, that circulate in these communicative spaces were, were too, numer too numerous to itemize uh, in the paper. So they're obviously way too numerous to itemize in this presentation. You can see some of the more prominent on this slide. They're not listed in any particular order. But there is a lot of talk about the ones at the bottom of this list, which of course is what we're most interested in as well. The relationship between AI and inequality is a problem highlighted by speaker after speaker. The world is bifurcated uh, along racial and economic lines, and it's bifurcated geographically. In the developed world, there's a growing divide between those who can afford the good things offered by AI and those who can't. And several speakers express concern about development of systems which will be used against marginalized communities. But there's also the problem of inequality in a global perspective, um, with technology not only being developed, but also regulated in the rich North and West. Um, that's the point of departure, the rich North and, and West, and this is to the detriment of the global South. Um, at the heart of the rights discussion is the question of data ownership. So while the consensus in these communicative spaces is that data should not be owned by the state or by corporations, there's less agreement as to whether it should be considered the property of the individual or whether it's a collective good. And there's a fault line in these stories between Western conceptions of property rights and the view from the global south. But that is so interesting and so complicated that it deserves more than a soundbite. So I won't even try to go into that just now. And the other overarching narrative theme relates to solutions that emerge from these AI narratives. So the question of what can be done to preserve that space where people are able to push back against some of the excesses that we're seeing is the way that one of our speakers put it. And again, we'll refer you to our paper for more on the different solutions because they are more numerous than this. So despite the insider knowledge of disheartening developments and frankly quite uh, frightening developments and the problematic um, uses to which AI is put, I have to say we were struck by the note of hope um, that runs through a lot of these stories. They're not all dystopic. We don't have time to let you read this slide. Uh, the quote is in the paper if you're interested. Um, but speaking of the cosmos, here is our last slide and Max will have the last word with that. So where, where did we end up after conducting this research? And by inhabiting these communicative spaces and through listening to these actors we listen to, we realize that there's this type of methodological struggle inherent to this arena of study, at least the way we've conducted it. By looking at AI narratives in a global perspective, we were able to tease out tensions between different ways that AI is made sense of and what the identified problems and solutions are surrounding it. However, this opportunity to recognize this methodological struggle is fleeting. Teasing out tensions doesn't result in those tensions remaining clear and you know, very cleanly categorized as we presented them in a table. Outside of scholarship or the academy, context, actors, and power are consistently at play, meaning that those tensions rebundle into the complexity that is the deployment and use of AI on a global scale. 
So the snapshot that we've provided here is fast moving and continually developing. And by conducting this research, we hope to provide an idea of how AI is being spoken about today to potentially better understand developments of both the technology and discussions about it in the future. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Another uh, very interesting paper. And we now move on to our fourth presentation, uh, Boundary Work in Internet Governance, the Historic Role of Layers and the E2E Argument. This is authored by uh, Carolina Aguera and uh, Diego Canabarro, who wrote in the chat that he just had surgery. So get well soon, uh, Diego, and uh, thank you for joining us. We uh, look forward to your paper, guys. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here again in GigaNet in this wonderful space for IG scholars. Um, okay, this is um, a work that we've been uh, developing with uh, Diego Canavarro and myself. Diego is here, has been commented on the chat. I mean, he is reading and participating, but uh, he is uh, in a post-surgery recovery mode. So um, I will be doing the speaking. We have been reflecting greatly um, over the past years, but I would say in the last year in particular, and a lot of it has been uh, partly um, a, a task that we have had um, as part of uh, teaching uh, internet governance to students in, in the last years. Um, what is internet governance? What is the digital governance? Where are the, where are the borders and boundaries? And we have uh, been um, addressing more IR literature that um, colleagues um, in, in the center where um, I am based now, um, the Center for Global Cooperation Research, um, have been engaging in other more boundary work concerning IR scholarship, international relations scholarship concerning migration, climate change, etc. And, um, and even the definition of um, more uh, sociological processes around institutions and professions. And this literature around border and boundary making is something that we find is extremely useful for us to address this, this very uh, important question that we uh, as scholars and not Diego and myself, but I think I'm, I can speak here for the uh, larger global uh, GigaNet community. We are always <laughs> thinking about how and why uh, and in which ways is uh, internet governance, uh, scholarship and practice evolving. So um, in this work, uh, which is in, in, a, in a preliminary stage, but um, again, we have been having uh, year long discussions with, uh, with Diego working on this. Um, we want to sort of kickstart and address more largely. I mean, how do this uh, old and new forces uh, that have been being uh, taken into consideration in internet governance literature, how are they addressing definitional borders of what is the internet, both from a material that is infrastructural perspective, and how those clashes feed back into and are reinforced by what we say boundary making, remaking, and unmaking in internet governance as a field of inquiry. So um, this is our departing uh, point, and we aim in this paper, our specific goal is uh, to um, address specifically what we think is the core of what is the internet. So when we try to think about the boundaries of the internet, uh, we say, okay, this, our proposition is, it's the end-to-end -end principle that is basically what defines the internet we still have today from the one we had over uh, four decades ago. So the question is to what extent have the layered model of the internet and the end-to-end -end principle defined boundary work around the internet and internet governance? And here we are putting in tension both the layered model, I mean, this layered approach and, and the end-to-end -end principle, and we're going to discuss this uh, shortly. While I was mentioning um, a few minutes ago, we are departing from uh, boundary work and social theory, um, addressing literature that has been working uh, the definition of certain professional spaces uh, through their practices and the formation of institutions and regulatory practices, notably the, the work of uh, the notable work of, of Abbott. Um, we are also, of course, addressing traditional uh, social science, uh, social science and scholars um, in the idea of concept formation, because we are, uh, we are not sort of falling in love into why do we want to sort of re reframe or reintroduce uh, a linguistic turn around internet governance, but we really 
want to assess, I mean, what do we mean by internet governance today um, and looking at it in a, a historical perspective. We're also uh, aware um, and taking into consideration how boundary work has been addressed in geographical spaces and um, as mentioned before in international relations and for, for particular policy issues, particularly migration, but also, for example, the definition of um, territories that might not exist in a couple of decades time. Let's talk about the Arctic then. So um, in this perspective, I mean, through this literature is that we are working around um, our conception of borders and boundaries. Um, and we are tracing in this, in this um, uh, article um, uh, uh, and historizing what we think are some of the main contributions that we have seen uh, over the last uh, two decades concerning uh, what is the internet from a governance perspective. And these are some of the authors that we, we have uh, approached. And for this paper, we have basically done, um, addressed it through a literature review and a document analysis, mainly concerning RFCs. So, Boundary work is traditionally defined as, uh, is, uh, as a work concerned with the construction, blurring, teardown, maintenance, and reconstruction of, of boundaries that divide human activities, groups, and institutions in dynamics of inclusion, exclusion, differentiation, integration, collaboration, and competition. Um, and as, as mentioned with examples previously, these address um, things as diverse as social political governance, but also epistemic communities and many of them are more material and others are less material. And um, in a way, um, well, um, our, our approach is that, that a lot of what has been going on concerning internet governance conceptions around borders and boundaries is very much about the jurisdictional spaces, which are extremely uh, institutionalist and reified. And, and for this, we have, uh, I mean, lots of, of scholarship over the last two decades addressing this, but there is an intellectual demarcation um, of, uh, of, of the concept, which is much less visible, but it still influences um, how uh, internet governance from this uh, a cooperation, a global cooperation perspective, borrowing Hoffius and Crank's approach ab about how less visible boundaries concerning the epistemic and the knowledge formation of a concept can be achieved in this boundary work. Boundary work in IG, we, we define, I mean, we, ad we address uh, three uh, um, main uh, literature approaches. Um, the, the, I mean, uh, um, internet governance is a field of inquiry uh, and the different uh, inter and multidisciplinary strands that have addressed it the field as a field of practice and where um, we, we have narrow and, um, and broader approaches concerning uh, internet governance, the narrow approaches concerning initially the um, definition of institutions and practices and the borders around the internet concerning critical uh, internet infrastructure functions and how this expanded from WISIS onwards. And more lately, I mean, in, in, in the last decade in particular, I mean, it's the internet governance has become conflated with digital governance more generally. And we have a conflation of governance of the internet, that is the principles of internet governance, the governance on the internet concerning the uses on the internet of uh, the internet and governance with the internet as the affordances of the internet in global governance more generally. So uh, we argue and we look at two uh, principles that at, uh, at one point might seem that they are um, um, contradictory or that they go um, addressing and address different uh, parts, but we say this is what actually is still the internet today, I mean, a layered approach um, where we have a specialized, um, a specialized um, govern regulatory body of uh, governance institutions and protocols in each of these layers and with particular benefits for different uh, communities um, and affordances and the end-to-end -end principle, which is um, which despite it also involving separation and specialization points towards precisely the opposite direction. It aims for the absence or minimization of these layers so that data can flow freely from one end to the other. So what we are saying is that a lot of the, um, in, in our, for the discussion and conclusions and maybe for uh, chat, uh, for the chat with, um, with the rest of the colleagues here um, is that we, um, 
we have been addressing in internet governance literature um, the char characteristics of the internet and how the artifact of the internet has defined then its um, its governance structures. What we are saying and what we try to bring in is how actually the ecosystem of its origins and the, the contemporary um, uh, forces that are shaping internet governance debates. And the, an example is one concerning platform governance, where it's big tech, internet giants, et cetera, that are shaping many of the rules around what is internet governance today. This is changing um, also the nature and the way we think about the internet and, and its governance. But um, is uh, the end-to-end -end, uh, layer, the end-to-end -end approach is still the overarching principle that we still see as addressing the core of what internet governance is. And we are expanding this work further with uh, the case of uh, the new IP protocol, where we have uh, a, a way uh, in which we can uh, analyze how contemporary political forces trying to address this, this sort of this still distributed um, internet governance arrangement can become more centralized and with more clearly defined boundaries, not just from a jurisdictional layer, but also from a protocological layer. Um, I look forward to the comments in the chat. I'm, I'm sorry if I went uh, a lot in my time. Thank you so much. That's OK. Only a couple of minutes. That's fine. Thank you very much. We now move to our uh, final presentation. Uh, and that's uh, authored by Neil Ten Orger from the University of Amsterdam. And the paper is entitled 5G and the notion of network ideology or the limitations of socio-technical imaginaries. Neil's the floor is yours. I think my uh, my paper is really just a uh, just a footnote to the previous paper, and that brings me to the point that I'm really thankful that we are here together in this time of uh, um, of global pandemic, where we don't get to travel a lot. It's really to see, really great to see that we are in this global community of researchers, and sometimes we can't be alone with our students and our books. But it's really great that together we're studying this object, and that even if though. Often it feels like we're stuck within our disciplines and with our methods. We really have this interdisciplinary field of work going on together. So that I'm really thankful for. So without further ado, I am Niels. I work at the University of Amsterdam at the Insight IT project, where we study the interrelation between citizenship and standard setting of digital technologies. And um, I wrote my thesis, Wired Norms, Inscription, Resistance and Subversion in the Governance of the Internet Infrastructure, studying the IETF, ICANN, and one of the RIRs, namely RIPE. And I thought if I only do in one more year a small postdoc to study telecommunication, then I will be done, can write my book, and just do the, the lower part of the, uh, of the traditional stack as we know it, and I can continue. But what I then found out was actually that maybe the internet and internet governance as we thought is not as uh, special as we, as we think it was and it might have been a, a short blip on a much longer trajectory going back to 1865 when the first transnational cables were laid and the international telegraph union as it then was still called was established because we know the traditional osi model with its uh, uh, with its different layers and also the different bodies that are there to govern and standardize the different parts of the, um, of the stack. So traditionally, it was the W3C for the upper parts of the stack, the IETF for the internet parts of the stack, the 3GPP for the telecoms part, and the IEEE for Wi-Fi and internet. But in 5G, you see that also functions that traditionally were standardized in other parts in other bodies are now also being standardized into 5G. That reminded me of, uh, um, of Heraclitus, who said, you cannot stop in the same river twice, later aptly put by Jacques Derrida, you cannot step in the same river once, because even the concept is changing all the time. And that's what we see with the internet. But to understand the internet, we've often to have different groups with different distinct expertises and interests work together, we really use the concept of socio-technical imaginaries this infrastructure that's co-produced by communities with distinct interests and expertises that share a socio-technical imaginary, namely a shared image of the future that allows to create a technology, policies, and institutions. But what we see is that the, that the imaginary of the internet has changed, as mentioned by Julie Cohen in Between Truth and Power, that it changed from an electronic superhighway to a cloud. 
And this is not by incident. A road has rules, whereas a cloud has not. But here, things are lacking where we look at the contestation between and among, body, among internet governance bodies. The socio-technical imaginary of the internet is running out of steam, but the tussles over the structure over the internet is very much happening. So where does this take place? And especially if we take into account the turn to infrastructure in internet governance as described by Muziani et al. So to explain this, I elaborate on the notion of network ideologies to help explain how power is exerted through transnational communication networks, such as through its standard setting. This should be an exercise of network and standard-based governance authority to the shaping of technological materiality. Working on this context and showing it empirically at work in the shaping of 5G networks. So here it shows how socio-technical imaginaries and political ideologies help explain how control is exercised over transnational communication networks, but not through these networks. And to increase the relevance of these work, I'm very thankful to Amazon and Facebook for uh, announcing their privately managed 5G networks that shows that the battle about the control over the infrastructure is moving further and further and further down the stack. And slowly we're seeing a telecommunification of the internet and an internetification of telecommunications. We see the telecom networks become more modular, but everything is being run over IP. Whereas traditionally you needed a stack from one hardware provider, you can now have it modular. But we also see that the networks are becoming way less transparent. And in both internet and telecommunication networks, the user is almost excommunicated from the network, having being rendered less and less control over the infrastructure. So whereas in response to the previous paper, end-to-end -end might still somehow be in place, those endpoints are by no means the same, and intelligence is added to the network. And we hardly know where that intelligence is, in which part of the edge. And that makes it really hard for, for users to actually engage with the network, and especially where users are now also being uh, configured through many devices, and these devices are getting less and less option to configure them. So there we see the, uh, uh, the imaginary changing from a uh, from an electronic superhighway into a cloud that might actually now concretely be an intransparent and opaque fog that is completely surrounding us and it becomes very hard to configure. So I'll stop there and then go to, uh, uh, I hope that there will be discussion about this. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, uh, Niels. That was uh, also very interesting. And now we have uh, the very difficult role of the discussant. Uh, and uh, we are uh, uh, very honored to be joined today by Hans Klein from the School of Public Policy, Georgia Institute of Technology, who's going to uh, make his remarks uh, over the papers that we just uh, heard. So, okay. Thank you, Rasha. Uh, I assume you can hear me and see me. So this wasn't as difficult as, as might have been feared. Uh, there's a lot of thematic consistency in this panel. I thought it was a great panel, uh, excellent papers. Uh, although it's entitled Internet Principles and Practices, I would have almost called it Internet Narratives and Concepts, because we really saw a, a consistent themes here of analyzing discourse, analyzing concepts, particularly um, what I liked relating it to power. So we heard concepts of access. What does that concept mean? What are the implications of it? Concept of internet freedom. What, is it, what does that mean? What are the implications of how we conceptualize it? Narratives of artificial intelligence. What does that tell us about power? Uh, definitional boundaries of the internet, uh, ideologies of networks, and so on. There's a, there's a lot of um, uh, consistency across here, and I think it's quite fruitful then to, 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 to see them in this way, all grouped together. Um, I, I'm happy to see the emphasis on power. It's something I'm interested in, and I think it's terrific to see this emphasis within internet governance. And I'll offer a, in some of my comments and suggestions, I'll be fairly consistent across the board saying, hey, let's pursue that examination of power. Power occurs within institutions, within fora. Um, many of this, much of the research here might be taken deeper into a, a study of institutions and fora and power. It gets us a little bit away from internet governance per se, but uh, many uh, authors seem to 
say that power plays out in different institutions and fora. Uh, and then they explore how the concepts uh, that, that, are, that issue from institutions affect social relations, but you could take it in another direction and say, okay, let's look at the fora, what's their history, who are the players, and so on. So that's kind of my uh, commentary. Particularly, I think, uh, look at Freedom House, look at RightsCon, um, National Endowment for Democracy. These are some of the institutions that kind of own some of the concepts that are touched on here. And, and I, it, based on my own research and, and literature that I've read, it's very productive to read the histories of these institutions uh, because they are very definitely uh, aware and conscious of the, the exercise of power. All right, so quickly, uh, Hannah Zamor Gutz's uh, paper on inequities of access. Uh, there's a critique of the plug and play, that oversimplified conception of access. And instead it's unpacked into a more complex uh, dimensions, resources, cultural capital, physical space, uh, et, et cetera. And the research was based on conferences such as Mozilla Fest, RightsCon, Internet Governance Forum, and uh, concludes that we should revisit some of the organizational institutional spaces that shape agendas. And here I'd say, yeah, absolutely, to, to, to revisit those spaces, look at a historical analysis of the institutions and those organizations. How did they come into being? Uh, how was power embedded in the institutions and therefore in the fora and therefore in the products of the fora, including the concepts of access. So um, do we see multiple, a succession of power structures lending themselves, uh, manifesting themselves in the concepts, such as the concept of access, and then the practices that fall from it. So if you go further upstream, you could study power in the institutions, look at the history and the creation of the institutions as well. So looking at RightsCon, for instance, I haven't done looked too much at RightsCon itself, but it's clear, you know, the big funders there, you find the large internet corporations. Uh, the United, the US agencies that play a big role, a background role, National Endowment for Democracy plays a big role in RightsCon. So if you understand the background institutions and the players, then you see, you understand the, the structure of the fora and the influences that it can have. Next paper by uh, Tatiana Lokot and Marielle Viermars, The Politics of Internet Freedom Rankings. This is a big one. Uh, I highly applaud this topic. The internet freedom rankings are a big deal. Um, and I think we can understand them somewhat, <clears throat> excuse me, in the context of ongoing the geopolitics, the discourse of geopolitics, um, information operations, information uh, warfare even. And so institutions create these rankings that arguably, depending on how you define the word freedom, we all like freedom, but depending on how you define it, uh, your friends or your enemies, your friends or your rivals might come out as more free or less free. And again, here we have Freedom House. I think it could have merited more attention. This Freedom House, again, sort of a Cold War institution. It, it, it plays a very important role in, in American foreign policy, um, uh, allegedly you know, shaping discourse. And I think there's a lot of excellent research that comes out of it and objective metrics. But there's also, uh, there is, I think, a discernible agenda, and you see that in its foundation, its formation, board of governors, uh, and so on. Third paper, AI narratives. Um, here, uh, we're looking at the different spaces and the different narratives that associate the, uh, those spaces. We're looking at inequality across geographies, across social levels, across levels of power, and the cross-cutting questions of spheres of the powerful global tech businesses versus the private citizens, and whether the uh, the powerful players are colonizing the spheres of private citizens. And uh, again, you could um, look at some of the, some of the, even institutions that are allegedly empowering the disempowered uh, merit uh, critical discussion. I don't know, I'd actually, if anybody has a, a literature on the origins of RightsCon and its interplay with uh, uh, defense agencies and so on, which do exist, or, or even democracy promotion agencies, I think that would be a fruitful examination. Okay, I assume I'm, I'm keeping it going here. Um, the boundary work on uh, internet governance, we look at how the relationship between technology design, the principles of technology design and boundaries. I'd be interested to, to explore that with some of the new technology designs that are emerging here. Uh, in particular, you know, uh, Niels Ten Overs, the next paper, talks about uh, standards of 5G, and wow, what, and I guess, this, Niels, you, you, you pointed this out, that 
Uh, you could look at boundaries, not only for the end-to-end -end design and the network layers model, but how other standards, IPv4 versus IPv6, Internet of Things, 5G, how is this uh, unfolding across boundaries? Of course, this is a much bigger uh, project, but I'm, it's sort of I'm, the, the productivity and the fertility of the ideas in this paper on internet boundaries uh, could be taken farther perhaps by other scholars with other technology designs. Uh, the last paper, Nielsen Ken Overs paper, 5G and the notion of network ideologies. Um, fascinating to see how the design of technology standards is used to shift power and the shifts of different actors, particularly uh, possibly uh, reducing the power of users and embedding more power in the um, infrastructure suppliers. But you also notice that there's a rivalry bet at the, between states, there's a geopolitical rivalry between China and the US over 5G standards. So there's two dimensions of tension between powerful states and, and industries versus users and between powerful states versus other powerful states. So I wonder how these two rivalries play out. And it may be that users could be beneficiaries of state of interstate rivalries. So the United States suddenly actively critiques uh, technologies and standards coming out of China, showing how they might disempower users because that makes China look bad. And China in turn uh, may critique US designs and how, uh, the, how they shift power away from users because China might have an incentive to do that to discredit its rival, the United States. So competition at the geopolitical level uh, over the politics of standards and the power dimension of standards, politics at the geopolitical level could in some ways perhaps benefit users uh, because they're not faced with one monolithic narrative. Rival states are saying different things and revealing different aspects. So in summary, uh, I thought the papers were great. I thought they were thematically consistent. I like the uh, focus on power. And I would say, uh, although at risk of departing from the world of internet governance per se, going towards greater institutional analysis and historical analysis of institutions would make this uh, research only better. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hans. That was really uh, interesting and, uh, and very uh, insightful. Uh, we have quite a bit of uh, uh, remarks in the chat and quite a bit of uh, questions. I hope we can get uh, through at least most of them. Uh, but before we do that, uh, would any of the, uh, of the presenters like to uh, respond to Hans' remarks? Jump in and say, completely agree. Uh, definitely looked for more on the history of RightsCon um, and would love to keep digging because I think it is super central to kind of everything that we've been talking about here, the historiography piece of that. Um, and just an interesting point is we got pretty far into our research before reason, realizing uh, Internet Dogonar, the Internet Days, the Swedish um, fora that we looked at is actually under the umbrella of a state agency. Um, so just pointing to how critical it is to go further back into those institutional analyses because going through the empirics, it looked very independent and everything they talked about was very independent. And there's a societal understanding of it as state independent. And then a little bit of Googling, a little bit of translating, it turns out that um, it's not actually the case. But thank you for the comment. It's uh, really well taken. Yeah, I think if you look at Freedom House, there's a very rich uh, uh, history there as well. Yeah, and just to, to respond on, on that note, we absolutely did look at the institutional kind of background of the organizations whose rankings we uh, reviewed, like we did three of them in depth and Freedom House is one of them. And obviously, yeah, there's a huge history and there's a reason why the kind of neoliberal ideas about internet freedom are very entrenched in, in all Freedom House rankings, not just the freedom on the net. So yeah, absolutely, I take your point. Thanks, Hans. Oh, thanks so much. So there is this, uh, there is the, um, the the remark from Hans, and the, and the, uh, which is in line consistent with the question by Marianne Franklin uh, uh, in the chat about whether users used to have much power or now stay to benefit from this tension. Sadly, I have to say that in almost all models, the users consist there as a source for data extraction, and the battle is more about who it gets to control these data streams. And I think that it's like the user who is now at the, at the losing hand of a battle that's much bigger, namely of rising and falling hegemonies, where Europe was, uh, uh, was a rising hegemony and set first mobile communications through Etsy. The US, of course, in response to uh, the launch of Sputnik satellite, developed the internet. But now we see China 
really developing the 5G standard and for uh, uh, and the US and Europe are seeing this and having to admit that they have uh, that they they have lost the battle to which they uh, invited China actually to play with them. So they come up with ways to come up with this loss and uh, we see different ways of dealing with that part of dealing with this trauma is the burning of infrastructure by people who say don't trust it the production of concerns of insecurity that have never been produced but actually only been explicated by the nsa in gchq so i'm afraid that this will uh, uh, this this matter of uh, if we look at it through world systems analysis of falling hegemonies and rising hegemonies might not necessarily directly offer a, uh, a, a new imaginary for users, whereas the tele, whereas the, whereas the communication could the technology could actually provide for that. So there is perhaps a chance, perhaps in uh, policies by the European Commission, to open source 5G uh, uh, standards and make all the communication and uh, computing power that is available in the protocols available for end users and not eradicate user choice by removing modems and connecting everything to a network that is not accessible for a user. Thank you. Um, thank you, Hans, for the, for the brilliant comments. Um, I'll just speak briefly on um, the funding. Um, I know you mentioned the institutional origins of some of these spaces and the funding sources, which I have looked into. And some things are as you'd expect, and some perhaps um, aren't as I'd, I'd expect. Um, for example, yes, we do see a lot of funding, for example, going to the IGF uh, from governments. But then interestingly, when we look at RightsCon, we see a huge volume of funding going from government donors into RightsCon, um, which is a curious, um, I guess, turn of events, considering we already have the IGF. And, and I think a broader question for, for my research and for us all here is what kind of what is kind of uh, this assertion of um, power coming from RightsCon and Access Now and why, why are they kind of expanding into these spaces and, and in some ways mimicking the structure of uh, the IGF in, in the creation of that space. Um, and then you look at something like Mozilla Festival and we see um, the funding sources it's sometimes at odds with potentially the politics because uh, as we know uh, Mozilla gets a great deal of funding um, from Google um, in terms of um, corporate revenue and at the same time um, potentially that politics doesn't really resonate with that so definitely yes very interesting areas to explore thanks I was just uh, briefly trying to um, address uh, Hans's comments regarding institutional analysis and um, and power both um, I mean I think they are they are great uh, insights and avenues to continue exploring boundary work. I think Internet Governance Scholarship has done quite a bit uh, in that respect. Um, I think we need uh, to think about it more. And with I think um, we need to think about what are um, the new um, institutional avenues that are being raised. And this partly addressed one of the comments on the chat on platform governance. I mean, conflating Internet Governance with platform governance as, uh, I mean, it's... Um, it, it has conceptually a very strong um, distinctiveness that we have to take into consideration. Platform governance is mainly concerning uh, private sector actors who can define those borders and boundaries around these platforms, while the internet is supposedly to be a much more open um, uh, artifact and technology. And so here we have power plays in internet governance, of course, um, uh, it's definitely there. So, but thank you. Um, I think it's, uh, they are great points. Well, as I said, we have quite a few questions in, in the chat, but here's one uh, to uh, uh, Tanya uh, from Hannah, actually. And she says, uh, brilliant paper, such interesting work. I'm curious if you saw any reflection among the creators of the rankings regarding the concerns you raise. Also would love to know more about what you saw regarding the funding sources. Were they openly available and did the funding sources seem to relate significantly to the outputs, to the ranking outputs? Thank you. Thanks, Hannah. That's a great question. Um, in terms of reflections on concerns, um, I think there were a few sort of caveats with regard to say how the methodology has to change or what some of the limitations are. So I'll give you an example. So Freedom on the Net, for instance, um, once the uh, Russia-Ukraine conflict began, um, they put a caveat into their Ukraine country report saying that we're assessing the whole country apart from the regions that are occupied by Russian and pro-Russian forces, because obviously the government has no power there. So there are different actors acting in those regions. But that was explicitly stated in the report. But some of the other concerns, like, you know, we changed the methodology, we turned the scoring around. It used to be 
zero best, 100 worst, and now it's the other way around. That was all relegated to footnotes and like methodology appendices, but it wasn't like anywhere up front in the reports. I think there's a bit of a missed chance there to be really transparent about the changes in the methodology and how it affects like longitudinal comparisons, which, you know, it severely undermines the validity essentially. But longitudinal compar comparisons are some of the things that this ranking is best known for. So maybe it's not in so much in their interest. With regard to the funding sources, so I think most of these organizations disclose their funding sources simply because that's what the law requires them to do. So they're a nonprofit um, or you know, they're a charity. And so they're required to list all of their funders. Um, and I mean, I think like we didn't go as far as saying, oh, well, who is funding them and how is this impacting their um, ranking outputs? But it's more so like, how does it impact, I guess, their interpretation of what internet freedom is and what aspects of it are important to measure, first of all. And I think that's where we saw, right, this, this kind of dependency between, you know, where these organizations are based, who, who they get funding from, and how it impacts um, how, how they view internet freedom. You know, is it freedom to, and is it freedom from? And when they talk about, for instance, access, you know, or do they just talk about access to infrastructure and all sorts of different um, services, or do they also talk about freedom of expression? Um, and, you know, free speech uh, as an inseparable part of access. So I think, you know, that's, that's really more what we were looking at is their conceptual understanding of internet freedom as something to be measured and not so much as, you know, which countries are they scoring as free and which countries they aren't scoring as free. Thank you, Tanya. And a question for uh, Hannah. Did you get the sense that your uh, respondents or participants would prefer to not be slotted into a youth space? Would they rather be sort of part of the mainstream? Uh, that's, a, that's a very interesting question and, and very important for the IGF uh, programming, I guess. Thank you for the question. Um, this is actually something that I have brought up with my um, participants. And um, so <clears throat> a lot of them have been through various schemes for inclusion into internet governance, right? They've done the um, internet society scheme or they've been through um, other, and they often jump from one to the other to the other to the other. And um, often that really educates them. They, they're very well informed. They have a lot of knowledge and they have a lot to offer. But, uh, and it also gives them a lot of confidence, I think, confidence to speak out and confidence to like have uh, strong opinions about what they want to see. Um, and for that reason, I mean, whilst they definitely say that they benefit from being in those spaces, they do struggle with having the youth label put on them when they're in the main spaces. And I think that they did uh, struggle with like having all the knowledge and having all the expertise, but they're not being seen in that way when they were in the main spaces. Um, and, and an example of that I'll give from today's session, actually, I mentioned that um, they ended up having this session that they weren't expecting. Um, it was marked on the program as being um, an emergent youth session. And they hadn't applied for that type of session. They had not mentioned anything around that when they'd applied, um, but that's how it had been labeled. So um, I think that they're struggling with this label because in some ways, um, and, and we do, and I do appreciate, and I do know that there's been a lot of effort for youth inclusion uh, in these spaces. And, but at the same time, that's leading them to have to talk about youth issues more than they necessarily think they would like to. And also undermining potential in their eyes, their opinions on other issues. That's very interesting. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Well, a question to uh, Carolina and, uh, and Diego. You guys got a, a bit of uh, questions in, in the chat, mostly around uh, your conceptualization of boundaries and, uh, and E2E. Uh, and also another question that says, I see your point on how discussions on IG shape the internet itself. Do you have any insight on how different means of regulation and governance for content, infrastructure, or logic might have influenced how the internet evolved. Since this paper was um, sent to GigaNet and in the last month we've been kind of working a lot and I'm reading Neil's comments as I'm thinking. <laughs> um, so there is, um, I mean, when when you talk to engineers, I mean, they they just uh, kind of, the idea of layers and this is, is related with the end-to-end -end principle as well. I mean, it's um, the forces around centralization and content delivery networks is something that is really uh, putting uh, at, at, at stake uh, some of the ideas around uh, layering in, in internet governance and um, and the end-to-end -end principle, but it's not that they are have disappeared. It's just that they are being um, rethought of. And and um, Niels in the chat is saying something which I think it's very it's very relevant. It's there's less um, accountability. There's less transparency. There's less information 
for others to understand how this uh, flows are uh, are working and and this is a trend that uh, since uh, since 2006 it's been clearly mapped and Jeff Houston from APNIC has been working around this in the flattening of the internet so we are seeing these trends this is not as developed in the paper I'm just saying this <laughs> for the record that we are thinking about this now and uh, with regards to platform governance and what is I, I mentioned it in my previous intervention I think that's uh, it's it's a um, 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 platform owners are in many cases also um, the, the owners of, of CDNs and they are again when uh, following Neil's um, um, presentation I mean they are owning uh, different kind layers uh, of, of uh, infrastructure layers when they were originally coming from uh, content. So we are seeing, and there's uh, there's a lot of literature in the last years uh, that has worked around how um, these uh, these players have been developing uh, protocol stances in uh, in um, data flows around um, around the internet, and and this has effects on the end-to-end -end principle. But again, Clara, I think that it's, it's very important to think about platform governance. Uh, with a distinctive new set of uh, actors or actors that have some interest in internet governance as we understand it originally and historically. And uh, there are new, uh, very clearly defined uh, borders in, in, in how uh, platforms are defining their, their spaces these days. And, and there's much more to be said about it. I think that for governments, it's much more interesting to think about internet governance as platform governance. And for them, <laughs> it's a one-stop shop. And, 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 we, and maybe we have to sort of fight back and say, okay, but platforms are not the internet. The internet is more than platforms. Uh, all right, and a question to Alexa and Max. Did your interviewees allude to ways in which discourse, particularly inequalities in whose voice gets heard, might be approached? Was it within or outside this forum? Yeah, I can, um, if I understand your question correctly, um, I would kind of split the answer into two parts. So when it came to the problems, I would say uh, fundamentally discourse is being approached outside the fora. And I would also say the problems were pretty much fundamentally geographical. There were other kind of sub problems within that, but it was really geography that everything came down to. But some of those subcategories or sub problems might be like definitional, definitional issues about AI. What is AI? Is it a field? Is it a technology? Depending on where a person is located or the work that they were doing, the speakers or panelists that we listened to, that definition was very different. And that definition in turn impacted the use of AI whether it's marginalizing or empowering certain voices and certain people. And so it's this really geographical polarization. Whereas the solutions, um, I would say very much not explicitly, could it be more within these fora. So some solutions such as like raising of consciousness and knowledge, socio-technical imaginaries and mindsets that are preconditioned for a more just uh, and equitable order when it comes to artificial intelligence, as well as fresh and different thinking. So it wasn't necessarily an explicit connection always to, okay, here at RightsCon in these panels we were listening to, we're gonna get new and fresh thinking. But I think there's kind of a, an easier connection to be made between the solutions that we heard, whereas the problems really were rooted in geographies, um, broadly speaking. Sounds good. Uh, question for Niels, did users, however defined, ever have that much power as an autonomy in the first place? even during the early days of telephone and te telegraph into the uh, world, <laughs> world days, into the World Wide Web days and, and since, are not users evoked by various interests, albeit from incom incompatible paradigms of use or choice? I talked about it a bit before, how users are now generally like points of data extraction. And with the rise of, of 5G, I think we'll see less and less uh, modems in our homes and less and less Wi-Fi and more direct connection of telecom networks with embedded SIM cards so that the user will need to do less and less configuration and everything will be increasingly uh, uh, connected by default and it will be less transparent where the computing is taking place. And part of this has already started with the rise of content distribution networks. And I'm not against content distribution network. It allowed the internet to work during the whole pandemic because not everything needed to go over the submarine cables, but we were, everyone was able to watch the same show from a, a caching server near them. 
But increasingly, we see also computation happening in the network, at least that's the promise of 5G. So it becomes harder and harder to know who is communicating with whom or what, and what is the authenticity of that communication. And with the end-to-end -end principle, at least it was initially done, I think, in RFC 700 something, it's like all hosts are equal. But in the current end-to-end -end environment, it's David and a huge Goliath in an end-to-end -to -end connection, right? So the endpoints are by no means equal. So it's much more the user versus the network operators and the content providers that are fighting over the soul, the character, and the characteristic of the user that is continuously being produced in this uh, tussle between multinational corporations. And what is so interesting is that this really and that really copies the the uh, the work that uh, Rita Zajac shows of the early radio and tele uh, telegraph networks, where in the US there was a strong monopoly on Western Union. In Europe, it were uh, uh, nation state, uh, 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 nation, uh, state corporations. And that is a tussle that we see out repeating. So uh, there is hope for us uh, academics that we might add to this discussion because this has happened before and generally people don't have that long history to look at. So we can stand on the shoulders of giants and, uh, and add to that discussion, hopefully that way. Uh, all right, we still have uh, about nine minutes to go. We have uh, a hand raised from uh, one of our audience members. So uh, Yik Chan Chin, uh, go ahead, please. And thank you for your patience. Actually, my question is um, to the panel in general, because we know these uh, power structures and also the you know shaping of the norms or, or the narratives about uh, different concepts. So, uh, and for my, because I have been participating in IGA for many years, and my observation is uh, starting from this year, they have like a town hall section for academia to participate. but. Uh, but look at all these high level panels, for example, the recent call for, you know, the high level of 10 person and which Milton against it. Okay. And we saw that at the strong voice is not actually from, uh, from us, it's more from private sector and also uh, private sector or even civil society NGOs uh, and also more increasingly is the government. So I'm just wondering, you know, we have all a critical approach towards all these uh, uh, the, 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 the theme of the, of the narratives, but how could this really make an impact, you know? And the, we saw the recent uh, uh, contestation about uh, the, uh, the U.S. They talk about the democracy, you know, compact, all this, all this conference and the, the, the camps between the democracy, non-democracy, liberal and non-liberal. All these uh, discourses are still flying along. So my question is to everyone: How can we really make an impact? You know, and uh, even in, in ideas, because it seems that the the, the, the critic system is still well confined to academic discussion, but in the real politics, you know, and uh, I didn't see much change of the dynamics right now. Very good point. Who would like to take a, a stab at? I mean, if I if I can maybe <laughs> try. Um, I mean, I I've been to a few IGFs in my time, and also a few um, Stockholm Internet Fora and FOCs and all of those other forums. And I think it's, you know, it is really difficult to to come at them with this kind of critical. Um, critical reviews and like you know tell them that like oh well actually you know internet freedom isn't really just connected to whether a country is a democracy or not a democracy there are lots of other factors in play or you know talk about um, infrastructure and ideology um, I do think though that it's important to continue bringing this up and obviously you know it's nice to have this like pre day zero thing where like we all understand each other and appreciate each other and agree with each other's points but I think it's also important to make space for this during the actual days of the conference. And this doesn't just apply to IGF, it applies to other fora as well. Um, I do think it's also important for us as academics, especially for us, many of whom are also, you know, we have our fingers in so many pies, we're involved with, with civil society groups and sometimes sit on different oversight boards or various other places where we connect with other stakeholders to keep also bringing those points up there. So not just, talking to other academics but also you know when we talk to 
funders, when we talk to companies, when we talk to governments, when we talk to these multi-stakeholder environments, to keep driving those points home that, you know, it is really important to look at where power is located and to remind people that, you know, the IGF program and which panels are scheduled at what time and which, which are relegated to 8 a.m. and which are during prime time, that's also an expression of power. And, you know, somebody somewhere makes decisions um, about who gets access um, and who gets access at the best times when you get a bigger audience. So I think it's just important to continue like ringing those bells and also to, to normalize these discussions, you know, like they're not some exotic <laughs> topic, like we're talking about things that really matter and that actually reflect what's happening, right? Because obviously like it's, you know, the, the organizers of all these fora um, see them as places to raise important issues. So if we think these issues are important, then, you know, we should maybe campaign for for having more presence in, in those other times when there are more eyeballs and more ears. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, a couple of things. Um, one thing I've observed, so I've been looking at a few different groups as a part of my research. And um, another group I've been looking at is um, indigenous um, identifying activists, particularly looking at um, access themes. And I've seen how um, their politics has become further integrated over time within Brightscorn in particular. And I think there is something to be noted or further investigated about the ways in which inclusion of these um, critical discourses happens at these spaces, like in, what, in which ways are they integrated, um, what is rewarded and what isn't, what is left outside of the purview of discussion and, and what is allowed to be criticised and what isn't. Because what I think we're beginning to see, and you see this a lot, um, in criticisms of like diversity and inclusion more generally is a kind of management of difference and 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 that's where potentially um those who operate outside in more informalized ways like digital grassroots one of my activist groups they're trying to counter that by um by not necessarily always following the rules, not necessarily always working through the um, fora in the ways that is expected, um, because they want to be more chaotic. They want to be outside of the management of their narratives and outside of their politics. And they're trying to um, operate in different ways. So kind of more guerrilla style tactics in their activism. Um, so there's two little aspects that I'd be interested in looking at more. Kind of reacted to um, the question of impact and wanted to, confess what I'm doing here and also to, to thank you all for letting Max and me in because we're most we submitted this paper so we could come and listen in to all you smart people talking about these things that that we know less about but once upon a time I, I came from IR um, and then I went over to the dark side of media studies and when I did that we start, stopped talking about impact I mean um, in, impact is something maybe political scientists and IR people feel more comfortable about talking about but when it when it came to the people whose voices we listened to and analyzed in our paper it was really striking how they emphasized that talking is important discourse is important um because that sets the 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 the, the terms for how problems are understood and and whether or not they're acted on and and the coming back again and again to like there's no black box you you know don't let the black box distract you the need for transparency and also the need to wrest the discussion away from popular culture that has so so much shaped our understanding of technology and and how it's used by the powerful or how it can be a tool of the the powerful and i hadn't expected that i thought there would be a lot more kind of technical discussion and uh, kind of governance discussion and so on so just um Maybe that's impact as well as just shaping the way we think, think about things and how we def define and identify problems is going to put it on somebody's agenda. And whether, whether those agendas are acted on, that's of course another issue which I'm very glad to, to leave to my former colleagues in political science and IR. Very interesting comment. Neil says yes, but how, how far do these uh, discourses travel? That's, uh, that's, I guess, the question. Well, we have a, a couple of minutes, one and a half minutes left. Uh, any, any of the, our participants want to have a, a final comment? Please go ahead. Hey, I'm a discussant, but I'd say something. Please. You know, I find uh, the, for me, somewhat the dilemma of our time is that this discourse of freedom and access and uh, rights and all that uh, which is so good, and, and yet it seems that it's somehow, if you, if you scratch it, it leads very quickly back to state institutions like rights cons being funded by governments, 
or uh, Freedom House being funded, but not only by government, but by real Cold War institutions. So on the one hand, the, this, this uh, very positive discourse has to a significant extent been co-opted. And I don't think there's that, that much critical perspective on it because who's gonna complain about human rights? Who's gonna complain about freedom? Um, and then it seems that some ways, you know, you have this in, in, in many of our countries, a kind of right wing critical attacks on these things, but there, you know, it's, it's right wing. For most of us academics, we're not that a, 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 attracted to a right wing critique. So we're struck between two uncomfortable alternatives, a fundamentally in some ways conservative embrace of rights and freedom and uh, openness, but it's a discourse that is fundamentally one of the status quo versus a kind of right-wing critique that's not very attractive. And, and, and where's the, the critical left in, in all this? If the discourse has been co-opted, uh, as, as I think we've seen in, in these papers today, is there a way to restore critique um, to our discourse? You know, I, and I find that this goes beyond internet governance. I find it a general problem. Uh, in, that we're seeing here and in other spheres of, of policy activity. On that note, I think we're uh, slightly above our time, about uh, one minute uh, above our time. Thank you all uh, for such interesting uh, papers and presentations. And thank you, Hans, for your uh, very insightful uh, comments. Thank you to all our uh, participants in, uh, in the chat and, uh, and all uh, those who've been following this uh, wonderful session. Um, have a lovely evening, afternoon, morning, wherever you are, and enjoy the rest of the IGF. Bye. And thank you, Russia. <laughs>